ladies, um, Maggie and Sarah from Southern Arizona Against Slavery, SAS for short. I'd like to introduce you to our group here, and I can tell from all the faces that we're here from all the way from Saddlebrook down to Green Valley, um, that we are representing um, Greater Tucson this morning. So we're anxious to meet you both, and we want you to meet us. Sarah Herndon is a licensed master social worker. She currently serves as an area manager overseeing four dialysis units in southeast Arizona. Uh, Sarah first encountered human trafficking during a study abroad trip to Vietnam, where she partnered with local social work teams rescuing minors out of sex trafficking. When Sarah returned to Tucson, she joined SAS's board of directors, where she's been training abolitionists throughout our community. Whenever she's not working at those two places, you'll find her backpacking, reading, or at competitive running events. Uh, this is a person who isn't doing much with her life, obviously. So anyway, Sarah, <laughs> welcome. Maggie McCain is also a licensed master social worker working as a child and family therapist. And while a student at the U of A, she first learned of human trafficking. So she did what some of us still wish we could do. She traveled to Indonesia and then Honduras in order to better understand the power and the control that um, dynamics of human trafficking have in different cultures. Maggie eventually returned to Tucson and became president of SAS in 2017. Maggie has her dog to hike with. She cooks, designs home improvement projects and spends time with her family. So Sarah and Maggie, we're the League of Women Voters from all over greater Tucson and we're open to hearing what you need us to know. So we'll ask questions and have comments as uh, probably at the end um, of your presentation. But again, I wanna thank you for being with us this morning and take it on, here we go. Well, thank you so much for having us. I was telling Joan and Mary Elizabeth uh, before everyone jumped on that Sarah and I always cater our presentation specifically for the needs of the group that we're meeting with. And Joan sent us some very specific requests for what we're going to be covering today. And Sarah and I had so much fun um, and we felt like the topics uh, that Joan had shared with us were so relevant that we really feel like this is one of our best presentations so far. Um, and so we really hope that you all learn um, as much as we did in kind of creating this and finding the most up to date research and kind of what exactly is going on specifically in southern Arizona, but also the world today as it relates to human trafficking. Okay, so as Joan mentioned, we are Southern Arizona Against Slavery. We call ourselves SAS for short. And SAS was fun, uh, founded more than 10 years ago by a couple living in Tucson who discovered that human trafficking exists in our community, but nobody is talking about it and no one is being educated on it. So they started this nonprofit with the purpose of educating everyday community members on what is human trafficking and how do we end it because we really believe that it's going to take all of us to abolish modern day slavery. So when I took over as president a couple of years ago, Sarah and I did a community wide needs assessment to see is this still a relevant need in our community do people still need to be educated on human trafficking. And what we found after several meetings throughout our community is that yes, people unfortunately still are um, unaware of human trafficking, unsure of what to look for, and not knowing who to call. So we continue our work um, creating these educational presentations and meeting people wherever they're at um, to really try to ensure that everyone knows what's going on and feels equipped to um, combat this, this modern day slavery, modern day issue. I think Joan did an excellent job of introducing Sarah and I, so I don't think we need to say anything more, Sarah. Uh, we can just dive right in. Super, thank you so much, Maggie. Um, so with this presentation today, we're gonna start with some of the basics of human trafficking. Um, Y'all are experts. I, I, we were um, exploring your website a bit when we were putting this presentation together. And it looks like you have a whole committee dedicated to educating yourself on this topic. But just to cover our bases, we like to start with some of the basics of human trafficking. And as the presentation goes on, we'll get more specific to um, Tucson and uh, Arizona. 
Um, if you do have questions along the way, please feel free to write those down. We have such a big group today. We're so excited for that. Uh, but to make sure that we're cognizant of everybody's time, we do want to hold those questions until the end. So please feel free to write them down uh, and share at the end or use our chat feature and we'd be happy to answer those. So slavery, 1863 versus 2020, um, we have seen that it's been 157 years since the Emancipation Proclamation came into effect. So what that means for most people, uh, they think that means slavery is over. Um, and unfortunately, that is not the case. Uh, what we know from our research and from the Polaris Project, which we will be citing a lot today, is that there are actually more slaves today than there ever have been in history. Um, and when folks hear that for the first time, they think, how is this possible? Um, and what we know is that there's an estimated 40.3 million victims of human trafficking globally, but this is a crime that happens behind the scenes, right? Folks that are um, in human trafficking don't always feel comfortable sharing that with others, so there's not a lot of self-reporting going on. Um, and then, of course, Johns or folks that are doing the human trafficking are not going to share this because it's an illegal practice. So although there are more slaves ever than there have been in history, we still uh, are looking to widen awareness and make folks aware that this is happening. So the average price of a slave around the world is just $90. Um, and what we know about human trafficking is that this is an economic uh, this is an economic trade for people, right? The average US sex trafficker can earn over $100,000 per girl or per victim. We're gonna use girl a lot in this presentation, but we do know that this happens to men and non-binary uh, folks as well. And when you think about that number, $100,000 per victim per year, uh, human trafficking is, is an interesting uh, crime. When you think of other crimes, other illegal crimes, such as drug sales, if I am selling you a drug, that's a one-time transaction, right? So I sell you the drug, you use the drug, and the transaction is over. Um, unfortunately, for victims of human trafficking, they're used over and over and over again. Um, so this can be very profitable for Johns, which is why we see this crime taking place at such a high rate around the world. Uh, it generates about $150 billion per year around the world. So again, just, just really astronomical numbers here. Uh, but knowing all of this, knowing that there's more slaves ever today in history, SAS's goal and many nonprofits goal working in human trafficking um, is that one slave is one too many and we want this issue eradicated across the globe. So there are a couple different forms of trafficking. Um, we have these grouped into a couple different areas. The first being sex trafficking, uh, which of course is any sexual act uh, for money. We also have labor trafficking, um, and that's any service that's done uh, against somebody's will. So you're gonna hear a lot of different terminology thrown around, uh, forced labor, forced child labor, bonded labor or debt bondage and domestic servitude. Um, and all of those fall into that category of labor trafficking. Um, there are different types of trafficking that SAS does not really focus on, uh, which would include child soldiers and organ trafficking. Um, these are pertinent issues and they're very serious and they occur just as much around the globe, uh, but SAS's mission is focused on eradicating sex trafficking and labor trafficking. So those are the two areas we're going to be talking most about today. So we have a couple of definitions here, which is really remarkable. Uh, when SAS first formed uh, several years ago now, um, we didn't have federal definitions of human trafficking, which made it really difficult for um, law enforcement agencies to uh, put a name to this crime that was happening. So we are very excited that we do finally have federal definitions that are recognized across our entire country. Uh, so sex trafficking occurs when a commercial sex act by an adult is induced by force, fraud, or coercion, and the person induced to perform that act has not yet attained 18 years of age. Labor trafficking, very similarly, uh, the recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for labor or services, again, through the use of force, fraud, or coercion, for the purpose of subjection to involuntary servitude, penage, debt bondage, or slavery. Uh, so in both of those definitions, we like to just point out that the three things that need to be present, force, fraud, or coercion. So these are folks that are brought in unknowingly to perform these acts um, and held against their will to conduct them. The next couple slides are going to be some graphics that we pulled from the Polaris project and they update their information um, every year. We just think that they do a great job visually of capturing exactly what's going on when it's related to human trafficking. 
Um, so this is a, a map of the United States, as you see, and the, the dots uh, indicate calls or text messages that were made to the National Human Trafficking Hotline phone number. These are not confirmed cases of trafficking. These are just calls or texts that were received um, saying that there was a concern or there was something occurring that they wanted the human trafficking hotline to be made aware of. Um, the red spots are the higher density, so increased number of calls. And then the blue spots are um, the like, less frequent calls that were made. As you can see, human trafficking calls, human trafficking concerns occur throughout our entire country. There's really no state or area that is um, ex except from, what I wanna say, exempt from this crime. Um, so that's something I think that is really important for us to know. Even Alaska, even Hawaii, calls, concerns are being made. Something else that typically um, folks point out to us is that the coastal regions seem to have a higher density of calls and concerns. Um, also around the Great Lakes in the Midwest um, have a high density of calls and concerns. We know that laws uh, pertaining to the transport of goods and services through barges, so on our major lakes and rivers, does not have as high of regulation as our border territory states. Um, so I think that that is one of the reasons we see the higher density in the Midwest is um, people are being transported through these barges because of unfortunately not strict enough laws or not laws that um, capture the needs of the victims of trafficking. I think the last point I'd like to make here is that we see a hot spot in Southern Arizona. And what that says to us is that it is un undeniable that human trafficking is occurring in our area. And for that reason, we feel as though us as community members have an obligation to be responding to this and meeting this need. We did find hope recently in that um, the human trafficking hotline saw a 20% increase last year in the number of victims and survivors who contacted the hotline directly. So we feel as though this is a huge victory that people are being made more aware of the human trafficking hotline phone number, as well as the um, text number and really reaching out when they need support. So typically what would happen is you text or you call the hotline the hotline asks you some basic information. First and foremost, are you safe? Can you get to a place that is safe? And then they connect you with um, local agencies or nonprofits that can help serve your needs immediately. So as you can see on this graph, text is the highest percentage of um, ways that the hotline is contacted. So again, when we're doing our work and we're thinking about getting this information to um, victims or at-risk individuals, we want to ensure that not only are we giving the phone number, but we're also giving the text information because that's what's being used. Another really important graphic talking about the age at the time sex or labor trafficking began. Um, you know, the, the darker blue line is sex trafficking, the lighter blue line is labor trafficking. You know, I think we can all agree that what stands out to us immediately is this huge peak in the age range of 15 to 17 for um, victimization, first victimization of sex trafficking. And so it, you know, it prompts us to ask ourselves, what is going on in that age range? Why are there so many individuals between the ages of 15 and 17 that are being recruited for sex trafficking? Um, and we'll definitely talk more about what those risk factors are and why we see that huge spike um, at that time. But um, I think we wanted to point this out because this is national research and it falls directly in line with the research we're finding for Southern Arizona specifically as well, is this um, high risk for um, our teens. I think the other thing that always stands out to me, and I don't think I have a good response as to why, is zero to eight also is um, a pretty significant peak. Um, so, you know, again, what's what's going on with these um, nonverbal, you know, for some for some of these years, zero to, you know, two, three years old, nonverbal, how are we educating um, this, this very young population to protect themselves against um, trafficking or victimization? How are we educating their parents to protect them against this crime? So nationally, the Polaris Project has found these to be the top five risk factors or vulnerabilities for trafficking victimization. Um, for sex trafficking, we can see substance use 
is the predominant concern um, for vulnerabilities, runaway or homeless youth, recent migration relocation, unstable housing, mental health concern. So I really want everyone um, to keep these in the back of their minds as we continue through this presentation and talk about Southern Arizona specifically, because we have a lot of these risk factors among our teen, teenage youth. Um, and so again, you know, national data is saying that these are the risk factors. So what are we as Arizona doing to help um, mitigate these risk factors? Labor trafficking, again, um, recent migration relocation is the highest risk factor for these folks. Unstable housing, criminal history, physical concern, substance use concern. So again, just kind of knowing what the risk factors are so we can plan around um, prevention or um, assistance for these folks so that trafficking doesn't have to be um, a solution or a direction that these um, folks to go to, you know, turn towards. Maggie, we do have a comment from Shirley who says there's sure. also legal trafficking in children and infants for adoption. Some women held to give birth over and over for adoption. Great point, Shirley. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think that brings up a good point that what Sarah had mentioned in the very beginning, that this is by nature a hidden crime. So I think people are doing working so hard to get the most accurate data and find out what's going on. But I think you know that's a, that's a huge concern, right? That we all should be aware of, but because it doesn't reach maybe the national data, it maybe it gets overlooked. So I really appreciate you bringing that to everyone's attention. And just again, kind of um, reiterating our point that there's so many unknowns, unfortunately. Um, again, just we felt like this was really important information. I'm not going to go through all of this um, specifically, but just thinking about recruitment tactics for sex and labor trafficking, as well as the top five forms of force, fraud, and coercion. Um, Sarah and I will talk a little bit later about our work of going into teen group homes in Tucson and Southern Arizona. And I would say that we have to be very specific with the ways that we're defining force, fraud, and coercion. Um, because for our teenage vulnerable youth, again, already in the group home, um, in foster care, uh, we see a lot of these things become normalized, right? So the ways that um, they feel as though they need to be in a relationship, um, the ways that they are treated by intimate partners, um, the ways that drugs are kind of being shared or forced, you know, on them. Um, so I, th I think this is such an important point when we think about the language that we're using when we describe human trafficking and what that looks like. And Maggie, I would point out too on the recruitment tactics, one of the things that folks typically ask us um, is about this first one, this uh, intimate partner or marriage proposition, and then familial being the two biggest um, recruitment tactics to bring folks into trafficking. Um, I think a lot of people think of the movie um, Taken, right? Uh, where someone is brought into sex trafficking, they're kidnapped, they're in a foreign country. It's, it's kind of this whole like mythical um, way that they get brought into trafficking. And unfortunately, that's not not what we see. What we see is that oftentimes people are brought in by an intimate partner, by a boyfriend, uh, by somebody that's claiming to be a, you know, a caring individual in this person's life, or even by family members. Um, so again, just kind of breaking down some of those myths of how this starts for folks um, is really important to opening our eyes for our own community. You know, how can I be more aware of this? How can I keep my eyes open to what's actually occurring in my community? Okay, we're going to show you a very short video clip um, that really discusses or displays um, the high risk of, again, teenagers and how social media and social media platforms are being used today to recruit individuals and how quickly um, this can occur. When my daughter Hope was young, she was a straight A student. I was a normal, regular kid. I loved to do theater. I loved soccer and cheerleading. Hope was filled with innocence, joy, and ambition. When I was 14, my whole life changed. My daughter Hope was kidnapped by sex traffickers. Hope was forced into prostitution. It all started because I posted on a social media site that I hated my mother. A woman messaged me back telling me that I could go stay with her and we'd go partying. She showed up within the next 45 minutes and 
I was gone. The suspects target girls who post comments about a negative home life on social media sites and chat rooms. The 14 year olds, oh, I hate my mom. She doesn't understand me. I can't wait to get out of here. That's how police say William Jacobs and Shayla Williams met a young North Texas victim who was just 14 years old. I walked into the motel room. I see a man sitting in the corner. The first thing that came out of his mouth was, take off your clothes so we can take these pictures. And I'm like, no, I'm not gonna take my clothes off. <sighs> he said, so you wanna do this the hard way? He hit me a couple times and after that I was out like a light. I woke up in the closet. The closet that I was in was about the size of me right here. After they took me out the closet, they took crushed up pills and they forced them down my throat. After they force fed me pills, I would try to move my body, but I couldn't pick myself up. They made me feel catatonic. After they drugged me, I had my first client. Hope says she knew if she wanted to make it, she had to find a way to cope. In order to survive my kidnapping, I had to create an alter ego. They told me that my name wasn't Hope anymore. It was Sophia, so that's the name that I took on. Sophia's the girl that walks with her head high. She was the one who dealt with all the clients and the Johns and the beatings. When I was with the traffickers, they never fed me. My source of food would be picking it out of the trash, drinking the water from the faucet. I bit my nails a lot. One time, I was taking a shower, and he busted it open and beat me with the belt because I locked the door. The couple is accused of trafficking the teen in eight different states in only a three week period. The traffickers made me sleep with men in each state, over 20 men a day. I could never be hope again after that. I was never going to be the same girl. We're gonna stop it there. It goes a little bit more into the family dynamic um, and what, you know how this ended up, um, but we just thought that was a really good depiction of how quickly this can happen. Again, um, definitely want to hear your comments, uh, but we'll save those for the end of, you know, a, a simple social media post and 45 minutes later, she is picked up and trafficked. Um, when we show this video to the teenagers in Southern Arizona in group homes, every single one of them is nodding their heads. Like, yep, people are reaching out to me on social media. Um, I have to be very careful with what I post on social media. Um, so we'll talk more about that at the, at the end, but um, we think that's extremely powerful. Okay, so now we're gonna dive a little bit more into the specifics about Arizona and Southern Arizona. Uh, so the first graphic we see here, this is statistics uh, taken in the year 2020. Um, and you can see on the graph here, the lighter color states uh, are less frequency of human trafficking cases. The darker colors are darker states. Um, we pulled up Arizona's data. So um, the rate per 100,000 is 3.16 and there were 234 reported human trafficking cases. Now again, and this is a crime that happens behind the scenes. So we know that this number is actually higher, right? This is just the data that we were able to collect from the Polaris project. Um, Arizona is no longer, thankfully, in the top 10 states of human trafficking cases, uh, but we're certainly not at the bottom either. We fall, you know, kind of in the middle of the road in our 50 states. Um, and again, as Maggie showed us on the map earlier, Southern Arizona is a hot spot for this. So this is occurring in Tucson in our own backyards um, and is another reason we just feel so passionate to share this information with y'all. So Southern Arizona's response, um, in 2015, the P Department of Justice uh, awarded the Enhanced Collaborative Model to Combat Human Trafficking to TPD and Kodak. Uh, so y'all might have heard of the organization Saturn, Southern Arizona Anti-Trafficking Unified Response Network. So that was created in 2015. They received a generous grant uh, from the federal government to you know, put together this coalition, including law enforcement agencies, judges, uh, Kodak, which is a behavioral health agency, and really just hit this issue from every angle to combat human trafficking um, in Southern Arizona, which was a huge victory for us. Uh, we saw a lot of movement, a lot of positive programs being put into place, um, tons of education, tons of resources, um, and it was just a really exciting time for folks in the human trafficking world uh, to get their name out there and to put their resources out there. Next slide, please, Maggie. 
Uh, we also saw that same response uh, for the state of Arizona. Um, for those of you that uh, do not know, Cindy McCain is actually a huge uh, supporter of anti-human trafficking initiatives. Um, and we have a PSA to play here um, from Arizona. Human trafficking has no place in our society and Arizona is taking a stand. Through the work of the Arizona Human Trafficking Council, our state is working to support victims and bring traffickers to justice. To date, Arizona has trained over 35,000 people to help prevent, identify, and respond to human trafficking. And we are focused on implementing victim-centered, trauma-informed care and services across our state. Elected officials, law enforcement, health professionals, members of the judicial system, ordinary citizens. It takes everyone working together to stop human trafficking. To find out how you can help bring human trafficking to an end, please visit nsextrafficking.az.gov. Join the fight today. Together we can, we must, and we will bring human trafficking to an end. So again, just a lot of really amazing momentum in, in Southern Arizona and in Arizona at large. Um, this is a priority that was put forth about in the year 2015 and something that we were seeing a lot of momentum with. Um, so you might be asking yourself then, where is that momentum now? Um, so we're in the year 2021. Uh, unfortunately, in March of 2019, uh, Saturn lost its federal funding. Um, so a lot of the money that was being funneled into the various programs for human trafficking survivors uh, came to an end. Um, and a lot of the groups that were, you know, kind of held together or supported by Saturn also dissolved at that time. Um, the local law enforcement was probably the biggest um, or the hardest hit rather when that funding went away. Um, since then, law enforcement has acknowledged that their Department on Human Trafficking is scarce. Um, they do have one officer that is dedicated to fighting human trafficking, uh, but she will admit herself that she is just about the only one that has the full caseload of human trafficking. Um, so unfortunately, funding, uh, when that goes away, that means a lot of the programs go away as well. So whereas Arizona and Doug Ducey and Cindy McCain are still putting forth the effort to make folks aware of human trafficking, um, the funding and the momentum that we had has since dissipated. So a lot of grassroots organizations, SAS included, have stepped forward to kind of fill some of those gaps and fill some of those needs. Uh, as Maggie mentioned, we did a needs assessment when we took on SAS, um, and a lot of those needs that were present back in 2017, we're still seeing the needs today in 2021. So I don't know if you all are familiar with Dr. Dominique Rowe Sepowitz, who is a professor out of ASU, and she does tremendous work with um, human sex trafficking specifically. And so a couple of years ago, she started what was called the Youth Experiences Survey. Um, it's also called YES for short, if you ever want to look it up. Um, and she's been doing these um, YES surveys in Southern Arizona specifically because she also realizes the dearth of good research that we have regarding human trafficking in our area. Um, and so, I, like I said, every year, I think about every year she's been doing it. The latest, most up-to-date research we could find was from 2016. But in a recent summit uh, Sarah attended last week, she said that she should have 2020 research coming out soon. So we're all looking forward to that. We want to talk about her, the, what she found from the survey that she completed. Um, 207 participants, um, only youth um, surveyed in Phoenix and Tucson. The average age was 21, but it included a lot of our, our teens, um, which is why this is really important information. Um, you have a couple different uh, sexual orientations that uh, youth identified as heterosexual, LGBTQ, um, and then the great majority of the participants were born and raised in Arizona. You'll see that the risk factors that we had um, identified earlier in the presentation were very much present for this population that were surveyed. Um, the, their living situation consisted of transitional housing, living on the streets, shelter, couch serving, so very much unstable. Substance use, um, more than half of the respondents reported that they had used drugs or alcohol. 20% believe they had an addiction to um, drugs or alcohol. And then mental health concern was also a risk factor and very much present in these youth. 
uh, a suicide attempt was reported by 40% of the respondents and 57 of the respondents reported experiencing a current mental health problem. So this is what's going on for um, the youth that were surveyed in Southern Arizona. Again, lots of risk factors are present. I like to point out um, a couple of these key findings, but I really encourage everyone to go uh, look up this survey. It's free, available online because it's all really good information. Um, but these two main points, we see that 33.2% of the homeless young adults identifying, identified as being a sex trafficking victim. But then we see a greater percentage, 38.6% reported that they had been sex trafficked. Now this might just be minor semantics on the surface, but what this tells us is that youth don't always identify as being sex trafficking victims, despite their ability to acknowledge that they've been trafficked. So this is again, just really important for us as community members, especially for those of us who have an impact. Maybe we have face-to-face -face interactions with these youth, maybe we're healthcare workers, Maybe, you know, I, I heard before that we have some historic legislators um, joining us today. When we are asking questions or we are putting out information to the public, we need to be conscious of the fact that these people may not be identifying as victims, that we really need to ask questions in a way that just gives us the facts of what is occurring respecting how they identify. Of course, we would never say, no, no, you're a victim, um, but really asking questions, not, have you ever been a victim of sex trafficking? This data tells us that some people would say no, even if they have been victimized um, in the area of sex trafficking. So I hope that you kind of take away kind of the significance of that. Um, I, I'd love to talk about that further if you would like to. Um, and then I'm just gonna jump to the bottom. Um, where it says the most common reasons identified by the participants um, that they engaged in or they were victimized by sex trafficking was for money, a place to stay, and for drugs. So again, I think that's really good information for us as community members to know how can we be meeting those needs of this population in other ways than um, them getting involved in sex trafficking, right? So how do we provide um, their basic needs so that they, you know, have financial uh, accommodations for food and shelter and those types of things. How are we providing drug prevention or um, safe drug treatment for these individuals? Uh, Joan had asked us to speak specifically about the LGBTQ community. Um, and so it, this study did find that this population of participants were increasingly likely over the three years um, at this point in the survey, to report being a sex trafficking victim. Um, so it went from 38% of the LGBTQ population to 54%. So that's a very significant jump in, um, again, the risk factor of being LGBTQ. We also find in our localized data um, that mirrors what is found in national data that participants are reporting increased use of technology in their exploitation. Um, so kind of this idea of have, being on social media, posting um, is getting them involved in trafficking as well as social media is being used to advertise um, sex trafficking services. Uh, so it says Facebook and it also says Backpage. I don't know if you all are familiar with the um, recent events concerning Backpage. We can talk about more. We can talk about that more at the end, um, but Backpage no longer exists. Um, but we know that social media and web platforms are being used to advertise uh, victims. Whereas, you know, historically we're not seeing people on the streets or things like that as much as um, through the internet. And I think, again, this raises the point Sarah and I were talking about with COVID and so many of our youth being online and doing school online, um, traffickers know this. Traffickers unfortunately are smart and they're taking advantage of the fact that our youth are online all the time. 
Okay, so we're going to shift gears a bit here. Um, we did have a good question raised by Betsy asking if we would be able to share this presentation with y'all um, following this meeting. And the answer to that is yes, uh, we can send it over to Joan who can distribute it um, as needed to the group. We're always happy to do that. Um, so we hit you with a lot of statistics and a lot of good information from both research, from the Polaris Project. Um, and again, we're happy to answer any questions on that as we move forward. But we are going to shift gears a bit and talk about our experiences uh, working in the community. Uh, because again, statistics are one thing, but to be face to face with folks that are at risk um, is a whole nother ball ballgame. Uh, so you do see a picture of us here. This was actually taken last year um, at Mary's Mission, which is a foster home down in Sierra Vista, um, Southern Arizona against slavery does cover all of southern Arizona so we're happy to travel to meet with folks um, and what we like to do in our foster group homes is just meet the kids really where they're at um, talk about some of the things that they're seeing online talk about social media safety um, and really just get to the root of you know where they might uh, find themselves in a predicament um, one of the favorite stories that we like to tell we were reviewing um, that Dr. Phil video and as Maggie mentioned, a lot of times foster youth uh, will be nodding along and saying, yeah, I recognize that. Um, so Maggie and I were in a group home here in Tucson um, and a girl was you know, pretty intently looking at her phone through that video and she raised her hand. She said, I have a question. There's a man who's gonna bring me a new phone later. Do, should I trust him? And we're like, wow. So this is just happening in action. Um, and we believe that we did stop you know, human trafficking from occurring. That's a really common tactic for traffickers to use to, um, you know, uh, single folks out on social media, whether that be in the video, like where she says, I hate my mom, I wish I could get out of here, um, or saying something like, I wish I had new clothes, I wish I could get a new phone, I wish I lived in a better living situation. So traffickers will take that information and offer them the world, right? Offer them that drug that they're seeking, offer them that new phone that they're looking for. Um, and when they show up, because the children will provide an address typically, uh, when they show up, they say, okay, just hop in the car and we'll go get that phone together and it truly is that simple um, for them to be brought into a trafficking situation. So we meet in these group homes about quarterly um, and after every presentation we always get folks coming up to us afterwards asking questions about their own experiences. So we do feel as though this is one of the most important uh, presentations that we do is in these foster homes. Uh, but of course, all of us experience things in our community. Um, so equipping ourselves with this knowledge uh, can really help open up our eyes and hopefully combat human trafficking in our areas. We also wanted to share just additional ongoing work that we do. Um, you know, January was National Human Trafficking Awareness Month. Um, so we do um, campaigns, you know, again, our sole mission is to promote awareness and education. So we have a billboard campaign currently up. You can see our billboard on Miracle Mile if you're in that area right now. Um, and then we also have bus stop benches. So the, the same information on bus stops um, for, for it to be readily accessible to our um, community members. Um, we also continue to have people reach out to us to do interviews or um, I guess interviews, yeah, either on the radio or for magazines or newspapers or things like that. So that just continues. So we say this because it continues to show us that um, people still don't really know a lot about human trafficking and still understand that there needs to be more conversation about this topic, um, such as some of the work that we do. Okay, so some good tools for your toolbox. Uh, one of the things that we mentioned at SAS is like we like to equip modern day abolitionists. Uh, so we're hoping to give you some tools that you can take out into the community um, and share with each other. So to kick us off, we're gonna go over some red flags for both sex trafficking and labor trafficking. Um, what we hope that this does for you is just put a, you know, a little thing in the back of your head that you would be able to ask yourself some more questions if you saw something that you thought could be trafficking. Now, of course, we like to give the caveat just because you see one of these red flags does not automatically mean that this is somebody who is a victim of sex trafficking, but it's just something to look for. Um, so with sex trafficking, typically folks will be with a companion who is noticeably older, dominating, or refuses to leave them alone. Um, that's going to be seen frequently at places like a doctor's office or a mental health visit. Um, if they say that they, you know, no, I will not let you see, you know, my sister, they might call her alone. I have to be present with her, that sort of thing. 
Um, if they have a history of homelessness or chronic running away, um, we do see movement um, as a major risk factor. So if you're doing an intake on somebody, let's say, or you've met someone for the first time and they've mentioned living in multiple states in a short amount of time, that's something that you might wanna make note of. Um, if they have branding tattoos, so we do have a picture here of some initials with a crown. Um, that's a really common tattoo that we see, those crowns and initials, um, as well as barcodes and chains. Um, so again, tattoos are becoming more and more prevalent in our society, so that doesn't mean that any tattoos signify sex trafficking, but those three specifically are ones that we see quite frequently. Um, and then any untreated STDs or STIs or repeated physical trauma are some risk factors. Some red flags for labor trafficking. Now, labor trafficking is a little bit harder to identify. Um, the last point on here says that they really self-identify self -identify as being trafficked. Instead, they just have a bad boss or a job that they don't like. Um, because labor trafficking um, occurs in all major elements of the workforce, whether that be in hotels or forced begging or door-to-door -door sales, it's a little bit harder to identify. Um, but some of the things that we look for are workers lack freedom of movement. So if somebody says they have to stay in the same area as their place of work, um, folks that have long hours or little to no pay, um, workers that are undocumented. Um, in another presentation that we do, we talk about how a lot of folks can be brought over from um, other countries and brought to this country with the promise of, if you work here, we can get you documents to get you citizenship here. Once they come, they're held hostage and put into labor trafficking with the notion that if you try to leave, we're gonna turn you into immigration authorities. So we see that a lot as well. Um, so again, just some, some really good information. You will have this slide afterward to go over all of this, um, but those are just some of the red flags for labor trafficking. I, I will just also add that uh, that goes along with um, sex trafficking victimization, that there is just kind of, of course, misinformation um, where I was speaking to, of course, like a friend of a friend who sounded like they were in a, a very precarious situation and I was just encouraging them to reach out to law enforcement. You know, there's lots of red flags of trafficking going on and this issue of, well, I don't have my proper documentation. And so you know, I wouldn't be able to go to law enforcement. Um, I think lots of us who are aware of the laws know that they would be you know, typically um, immune from any kind of deportation or something like that. But again, kind of this uh, threat of citizenship is something that is often held over uh, victims of labor and sex trafficking over their heads. If you are an individual who um, has, you know, contact in your place of work or volunteer, or maybe a healthcare worker or a mental health professional, and you feel as though um, you could have this conversation with individuals, we just wanted to provide you with some prompts in kind of starting that conversation. Um, safety is always the number one priority, so we're not saying that necessarily it would be safe to walk up to someone on the street and start asking them questions. Um, but if you do feel as though you're in a position where this would be helpful information, we wanted to include it. Really what it comes down to though, and what I really encourage everyone, every one of us to do, is to just not be in denial that if we see red flags, that trafficking is occurring. The likelihood that if a combination of these red flags and us having some you know, additional indicators, the likelihood is that it probably is happening. And then we just don't want people to be in denial, like, oh, there's no way, or that just doesn't happen here. It does. And so asking open-ended questions to um, really promote safety and really promote trust to say, you know, just what's going on? Just tell me about how things are working out for you um, and letting them tell their story. Uh, unfortunately, you know, I can even say when I go to the doctor's office, they ask, you know, those five basic questions or something. And it's always like, and you feel safe at home, right? So it's like asking in the affirmative. So if I didn't feel safe at home, that would be kind of hard to say, well, no, actually I don't. We wanna be asking in a very open-ended way of, you know, do you feel safe at home? Tell me about your home life. Um, when was the last time you paid someone to have sex? When was the last time you traded sex for a place to stay? Just kind of asking in the affirmative and then they can deny it if, that's, if, if, that, if that is not the case. Maggie, I do want to make note of something Shirley wrote to the group. So she said here, I'm so glad to see almost equal attention paid to labor trafficking. It's a big concern of mine and often overlooked. Um, and I'm so glad you mentioned that, Shirley. So in another presentation, we kind of go into the numbers of this, uh, but we don't have it in this presentation. But what we know is that labor trafficking actually occurs nine times more likely than sex trafficking. Um, so for those of us that are working in human trafficking issues, um, it's really important to 
talk about labor trafficking. Um, unfortunately, what I'll tell you is that even when we're contacted by newspapers and media outlets, um, the old saying sex sells, um, that's unfortunately true even with human trafficking. So we will often see um, a story and they'll ask specifically, can you talk to us about sex trafficking? Now we never wanna turn away an opportunity to educate folks, but we always do ask, can we please bring up labor trafficking as well? Because it actually is more prevalent in society and because it's not talked about as much, there's, that's even more reason to bring it up. So I really appreciate you say, saying that, Shirley, so we could share that in information. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, in regards to prevention, you know, I think education is always our top priority, just staying informed with what is going on, having these conversations, not being afraid to have these conversations with our friends, our family, our children, um, our grandchildren, and just really ensuring that they know what to look out for, right? Um, we really encourage everyone to, you know, pull out your phones or jot down the number for the National Human Trafficking Hotline, as well as the text, which is the 233733, um, just so that you have that on hand. So if you see something, um, you know who to call right away and you don't have to kind of be like, well, I don't have the number. You know, we always justify ourselves out of situations. But um, Sarah has a great story of, if you don't mind me just telling it really quickly, Sarah, walking her dog in her um, neighborhood and she used to live right off the 10 and seeing a truck pulled over and kind of a, an odd place for a truck to be pulled over. And so kind of just, again, just kind of make, making a note, like a oh, little bit of a red flag, maybe it's nothing, but I do note that. And then as she kind of kept her eye on it, um, a man and a younger female got out of a, a nearby truck and went over to that truck and the little girl got in the truck, um, the truck, uh, what was it, cabin. And she was like, you know what, maybe that's nothing, right? Maybe that's the girl's dad or her grandfather, and this is a totally normal situation, but maybe it's not. And there's enough red flags, and I have the phone number, and I'm just going to make the call. And so she did. And we don't know what happened with that, and maybe it was nothing, but when we have the tools in our toolbox and we have our phone number readily available, we can take those steps to action. I would say in there, Maggie, as well, yeah. um, I love your note about the mandated reporting laws. So Maggie and I are both social workers by trade. I imagine some of you out there might be healthcare professionals, teachers, social workers. Um, and so mandated reporting laws do apply to human trafficking. Um, so the same way that we hope that if anyone were to see, you know, physical abuse happening to a child, let's say in a parking lot or something like that, and you call 911, we would hope that folks have that same drive, that same initiative to just go ahead and make that call. If it looks strange, to you if you have that bad gut feeling just go ahead and call it it's not going to hurt um, and in fact it might save a life joan had asked us to describe our dream world which was an amazing prompt that we haven't been asked before but it really i think encapsulate encapsulates everything that we've been talking about i mean prevention would be our number one priority if we could prevent this crime from continuing to occur and these individuals did not have to live a life enslaved. Um, and if that isn't possible, that when we do have contact with these um, victims, that they are treated as such, um, that really the trauma-informed care practices are upheld. Um, thankfully, I think our law enforcement and um, legislation has made tons of progress because historically, even victims of this crime were not treated as such and were treated as the perpetrators of crime. Um, and we're really seeing a huge change so that that would continue to occur, um, that we have laws that support um, victim, the victims and their rehabilitation, um, it really promote their safety and security. Um, you know, it obviously it takes all of us. And so that's kind of the picture of the children is this is not confined to one facet of our society uh, because it be has become an economic issue. It really impacts each and every one of us. And so that's why it really takes each and every one of us to overcome it. Something that Sarah and I are also passionate about is um, safe and appropriate housing and rehabilitation for uh, the specific needs of human trafficking survivors. Um, at this time, Southern Arizona does not, well, I, I should say Tucson, does not have specific housing like this. Um, there's been a couple individuals who are really pushing to get the appropriate funding to make that occur, but it simply doesn't exist. So thankfully we have 
really fantastic other resources such as Emerge who um, will take in survivors of trafficking, but we know that the needs of trafficking survivors are very different than the needs of domestic violent, um, survivors of domestic violence. So we really, again, just wanna be meeting their needs um, specifically and unfortunately that, that is not occurring at this time. Truly the best compliment that Maggie and I get is after a presentation or, you know, sometimes we'll go into the same classrooms, you know, a couple of times. The best compliment we can get is when somebody says, after your presentation, I noticed that my uh, nail salon, for example, had something that raised a red flag for me. So I just went ahead and called. Um, we had a girl after one of our presentations tell us that she noticed something strange at a rest stop off of I-10 uh, where a busload of children got off and they weren't wearing like matching uniforms. It didn't appear that they they were on a sports team or something like that and they were ripping tags off of clothes and changing into new clothes um, and again that's a couple of red flags perhaps it was a church group we're not sure but she went ahead and made that call um, so again if you take nothing else away from this presentation please do just you know you utilize these tools that, that you have now in your toolbox to make those reports if you feel that you need to Okay, so we love this word, modern day abolitionist. So we hope that you've gotten some information from this presentation where you can put forth some of this knowledge into your own communities. Um, some more things that you can do, advocate for victim-centered law and policy. Um, with SAS, we are very fortunate to have a lawyer on our board of directors who follows laws and legislation that are being put forth that might affect trafficking. Uh, so if you follow us on social media or if you're part of our um, email listserv, we can send you information about those different laws. Uh, and we'll even write scripts for you to call in and speak about your um, ideas behind some of this, these laws. Um, like I say here, follow us on social media and visit our website, uh, get involved or donating to a local organization that's combating human trafficking. Um, and then just some calls to action here. Um, so sometimes we like to start a little bit smaller. I know uh, Maggie and I are both researchers at heart, so we like to equip ourselves with information. Uh, we have listed here a bunch of different documentaries that are all excellent um, and all available on your major streaming platforms like Netflix or YouTube. Uh, so the documentary, I Am Jane Doe, um, which follows a couple of women that were brought out of sex trafficking. Frontline Trafficked in America, which goes over labor trafficking here in the United States. Uh, Jeffrey Epstein, if you have not heard of Jeffrey Epstein, we highly encourage you to watch this uh, documentary as it goes into a lot of the um, power play situations that we see happening in trafficking. Uh, there's an excellent activity you can do at slaveryfootprint.org uh, that has you run through items in your house. Uh, what do you have in your medicine cabinet? How many shoes do you own? Um, what types of jewelry do you own at your house? And you input all of this data and at the end it'll tell you how many slaves you have working for you. Um, and you can go as in-depth as you like or as you know service level as you like, but it goes over a lot about labor trafficking specifically and the different industries where we see labor trafficking trafficking occurring, uh, specifically in clothing, uh, in jewelry, and things like that. So slaveryfootprint.org is a great place to do that activity. On the prior slide at the bottom, we also just have um, the major resources that we utilize to stay up to date with um, the most recent research and data. Um, so it's another resource for all of you to look into. Trafficking in Persons Report, Blair's Project, and International Justice Mission are some of our go-tos. And that is all we have for today. So we do wanna, you know, a little bit before, one minute before 11 o'clock, uh, we'd love to stay on a little bit longer to answer your questions. Um, and then I did just wanna make sure everyone had our contact information, our email address, website and on our social media. We're going to to um, make this PowerPoint available to anybody who wants it and um, we'll be informing you as to how that's going to happen. Does anyone have any comments or questions or concerns? Karen, yes. Yes, I have a question um, uh, for Maggie and I just wonder how does Yodo figure into this? Youth on their own. Yeah, that's actually a great a question. Organization, and I'm wondering how that can be more far reaching. Yeah, that's a great question. We actually, I don't think we, since I took over as president, we have not partner, partnered with Yodo, but that would be an excellent resource because they 
work directly with the children who have unstable housing or are in transition. And I know that I think that they received some um, funding changes this past year. Um, I know that some of the foster youth I work with were receiving some financial benefits and are no longer doing so. Um, so I don't think they do any specific uh, human trafficking prevention work, but I think that would be an excellent partner. So we can definitely reach out to them. I actually have a contact there. Yes, Mary Elizabeth. Yes. My question is, what is the single best phone number or point of communication I can put into my cell phone should I have the unhappy experience of encountering um, a situation as you described? Yeah, so I what think that's effective. Yeah, Go ahead. yes. That human trafficking hotline, I'm not sure if we're able to pull that slide back up, Maggie, but um, there's a hotline where you can call in or a text line um, that they call a warm text line. So a real person is going to respond to you on that text line. Um, the thing that I love about the human trafficking hotline, somebody private messaged me earlier um, and asked who runs that. So the Polaris Project actually runs that hotline. So it is a national hotline. But when you call in from your specific city or state, they connect you to local resources. And that's what I love about about them. They don't stop at the national level. They get you directly in contact with somebody that can help. Um, so the best thing about that hotline, oh, thank you, Maggie. She put it in the chat feature for everybody. The best part about that hotline is that they are equipped to answer any of your questions, take down any data. Um, they're able to point you in the right direction if this requires further follow-up with like police, yeah. right? So they'd be able to tell you, thank you for this information. Your next step is gonna be to call 911 and report this as well. Or if they have local resources that they can put you in contact with, maybe it's about housing, maybe it's about shelter, maybe it's about food, they would be able to point you in that, in that direction. So again, that hotline is now in your chat box here, 1-888-373-7444. Uh, and that's going to be the best place for you to start. Great question. Anyone else? Um, I have a question. Yeah, Phyllis. Yes. I know that Victoria Steele has been interested in sex trafficking, and one of the things she wanted to do was to a erase felonies for former pop prostitutes. The Johns get erased. But I understand for our state legislature said, yes, it could be erased after 99 years. So I was wondering, are you working at all to try to get this erased with Victoria Steele or any other legislators to try to get some of this erased? Because it prohibits former prostitutes from a lot of gainful employment. Employment as well as housing. Um, there are so many um, negatives to, to this injustice. Is that exactly what you said? We absolutely support uh, those types of laws being overturned. And again, having a more victim-centered policy and legislation in place. Um, so anytime those you know, a bill comes up that is related. That's exactly what Sarah was talking about. We typically would put it on our social media. Hey, this is the bill. This is how it impacts um, survivors or victims of trafficking. Here's a model script. Here's the number to call. We really try to give everyone all the information that they would need. Um, and we have our lawyer to help us follow those types of things. So absolutely, absolutely, we would support that. And one thing that I would tack on to that, you know, I hope from our presentation, you took away that this is a complex issue, right? We see a lot of other issues interlaced with this, whether that be substance dependence, uh, sometimes we'll see, you know, stacked charges for things like substance use, substance sales, things like that. Um, and then you also have to think even in a perfect situation where they are treated very well in the justice system, they do receive justice, they are able to get away with very little um, judicial consequences, now you have to say, okay, let's put you back into the workforce. When was the last time you had a job? Do you have access to a computer to be able to build a resume? How are you going to talk about the last three years of your life and why you haven't had, you know, employment during that time? Um, so those are a lot of the different um, 
uh, pieces of the puzzle that different nonprofits, SAS partners with lots of people that work on those types of things to say, this goes beyond just that day in court and it really goes into the rest of their lives. Um, so again, us and other agencies are working on all those types of things uh, to make sure that these uh, folks can integrate back into the normal world. Anyone else, please? Okay. I, I think what we've learned is that there are resources that we as league uh, interested in legislation and um, need to be apprised of. So we're going to stick close to you. Um, and especially since you have those resources to highlight the um, human trafficking legislation that might arise. There hasn't been much lately. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Victoria Steele tried several years ago, got some things through, and that was about the end. Um, but we're going to uh, keep apprised of what you know and the contacts you have. So ladies, I just wanna thank you for coming and being with us this, this morning. And um, um, Sarah, Maggie, we, the league, do thank you and for sharing your morning with us, for sharing your knowledge, your passion, especially. Uh, we are grateful and we're indebted to two young women who are doing what you are doing. Um, thank you for who you are and what you do. Thank you.